I want you to imagine your entire dreams being threatened in a second. You've worked your entire life, your family, your friends, everybody you know. It's one thing to have Tommy John once. I think it happens to a lot of people. And like, if I were to have it a second time, that's another year to oh 15 months of not playing baseball, kind of like being forgotten. I remember when the report came, to be honest with you, man, I thought that was the end of your career. All right, welcome back to the show, everybody. Fired up to have this gentleman here today. Let me describe his build. He's 6'6", about 240. They call him Thor, and it's very fitting. If you're watching the video, you can see that. He throws, when he's healthy, 100 miles an hour. He's got a sinker and a slider that he throws about 95 miles an hour, which just blows my, way, blows my mind that a human being can throw a baseball that fast because I played, and guys didn't throw that hard when I played. But he's a really unique athlete. He's thoughtful. He's a smart guy. He's one of these guys that's, He's kind of philosophical and a deep dude, and I wanted to pick his brain today because he's had an interesting career, and he's got some interesting thing going, going on in his life. So Noah Syndergaard, thank you for being here, brother. Thank you for having me. This is like uh, making my big league debut all over again. I'm super you, excited nervous? to be here. <laughs> um, just the uh, the other guests that you've had on, I feel like a, a man amongst gods. So just uh, oh, thank you, being here is a super exciting. So well, thank you um, for, for having me. The, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you, brother. Well, I'm I'm thrilled to have you. This guy's won a World Series game, by the way, if you're not a baseball fan. He's won a World Series game. Just signed, what is it, $21 million deal for a year? Mm-hmm. So One year deal with so, the Angels. So you're not starving, which is good. I'm, I'm happy for that. <laughs> I hope you're really proud of yourself. So you know what? He's got a book club, by the way. This guy's a reader. So if you go to his Instagram and you're interested in getting involved in his book club, and a couple of the people that are on books he's recommended, the authors have actually been on my show. So I want to pick your brain a little bit. How much – so you're obviously gifted at 6'6". Six, six. That didn't hurt, right? But – I'm reading about kind of like your ability to focus. You're going to be surprised what I know about you. I'm going back and I'm reading about this story when you're about eight years old. Mm-hmm. And your mom's at the game. Do you know this story? Do you remember this? I think I, I know yeah. what you're talking and about. And your, your mom is yelling at you. Like, right. I don't know, get going, let's go, Noah, or something that, like that. That you're was an impressive find. Yeah, well, you know, I do my research. And you, you kind of <laughs> yell back at her, shut up, right? And mm-hmm. now she's telling you, you're grounded. Right. And you get up to the plate. And you've got to compartmentalize and focus under this pressure, even at eight years old. It seems like a funny story, but it's not. You get up and do what? What do you do? Uh, I hit a home run, but I don't know if at that age I was compartmentalizing. I was more so might have env- envisioning my mom's head on the ball. So <laughs> that might have been that might have been anger. But now I could see where the, the value in being able to separate that, that space. Yeah. Well, you get back to the dugout, and she comes over and basically tells you you're ungrounded after yeah. you hit the home run. Yeah, so you right. learned some value in performing at a high level would get you rewards yeah. in your life. At exactly. That age anyway. So how much is the mental game important, though? So, you know, it doesn't hurt to throw as hard as you do and be your size and have the physical presence you have. But at your level, at the major league level, what's the mental difference? Because there's guys in AAA to throw 95 and 98 miles an hour that never get to the big leagues, that never stay, that don't win a World Series like you have, World Series game, that don't get $20 million plus deals. Is there a mental difference at that big league level or even the elite big league level that you see that separates people? I think there's a lot of different mental categories. Mm. I think one I can think of right off the top of the bat is being able to separate your personal life with Mm. how you perform in between the lines. There's, there's a lot of people that will take what's going on in their personal life and carry it to the baseball field. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that just re- like raises a lot of distractions when you're going out there com- competing, whether it's a fight with your significant other or just the everyday rigors of, of life. Uh, you just got to be able to, I think what separates the good from the great players in the big leagues is being able to, once you get to the ballpark, whenever it is, like sometimes I'll get there at 2 p.m. in the afternoon when, when I'm not pitching. Once you arrive at your locker, you got to be able to to separate what, from what's going on in your personal life and still be able to do your job. But I think that it happens with with everybody, regardless if you're a professional athlete or not. You got to be able to to separate your your personal life with how you craft your career. I um, do. I agree. Um, I would say, and another. Uh, component of the mental game is, you know, I mean, it sounds pretty cliche, but having a uh, a short memory, you know, mm-hmm. you give up a, a home run, you have a bad inning, you got to be able to forget about it, move on to the next pitch. You can't let whatever just happened that's in the past affect the future. Um, How do you do to... that? Like, because that is true, right? I mean, there, that is a separator. Do you give, is it a, maybe a five or six run inning or you just give that home run and you, 
get a couple outs and get back to the dugout, right? How do you do that? A lot of trial and error, mm-hmm. a lot of practice, different techniques. Like uh, a lot of pitchers will have uh, certain cues, like you know, uh, sweeping off the dirt of the rubber, kind of mm-hmm. like getting a, a fresh start. Yeah. Or picking out. I used to do like a wide peripheral gaze, and like I'd look at a a foul pole, and I'd try to look at the foul pole, but also see everything in my peripheral vision as well, and that would kind of center me back to the present moment um wow and i think all this is kind of came to be just because um i'm sure you you know like when i was i'm not sure if your mm-hmm. your your listeners mm-hmm. know much about how i grew up um but i was kind of a a chubby fat bashful kid wore glasses uh the rec spec goggles so i was kind of a bit of a, a geek and um i just had this growth mindset whether from a physical standpoint or a mental standpoint like my dad started taking me to the the ymca when i was probably 14 or 15 when i couldn't quite drive legally and i would just go to the gym because i knew i was a kind of a chubbier kid and i wanted to change that kind of suffered with bullying from time to time but it wasn't too bad because i ended up putting some of the kids in in headlocks because i got (laughs) uh, sick of it too much but since then it's just like the, the sky's the limit. I feel like where I was a year ago to where I am now, it's just like I exponentially, exponentially try to to learn more about training, the mindset, recovery, spirituality, um, developing a routine. It's just uh, something that's a huge passion of mine. Yeah. So you, you think that's why you're so humble? Because you grew up that way? I mean, a lot of athletes were great athletes since they were seven, eight years old. You're obviously really good, but there is a unique humility to you, even your spirit. You're, you're, you seem to be kind of a gentle, kind guy. You know what I mean? Do you think part of that was just the way that you grew up? You know, I had uh, great loving parents, and they came from parents that were loving and, and guided their, their kids in the right direction. So I'm extremely blessed and, and thankful for the, the upbringing that I had. Um, but yeah, I think being a growing up a kind of a, a fat, chubby, little, bashful, shy kid, kind of helped me stay humble and gave me a sense of humility that I still carry with me now. Yeah, I do too. I can see it on you. You it's when you're listening to Noah everybody, I want you to just, you know, step back. If you're a baseball fan like I am, this is one of the top young talents in the entire sport today and it's my favorite sport. If you're not a baseball fan and you're listening, I want you to picture a young man in his prime, super good looking dude if you're watching the YouTube, you know, very wealthy young man. 20 million plus a year, a lot of accolades. He's played in two markets, basically. He's played in New York and now in California. So this is a guy who's, you know, been at the pinnacle of sports. To have the level of humility that you're hearing in his voice is a lesson for all of you who want to be long-term achievers. I always say there's this nuance I think that successful people have, which is that just even happy people too, they nuance confidence, right? You got to have a ton of confidence to be successful, but they toe this line. I've been saying this a lot lately, combined with humility. And I think that's the formula for success and happiness. If you've, got to, you've played with guys, they have all this confidence and they think they're incredible. But sometimes if they don't have humility, they're not coached well. They won't take coaching, right? They won't grow. They don't want to change. They don't want to innovate. And those guys sometimes get in trouble in sports, business, and life. Then there's the real humble guys, but they don't have the confidence to meet the moment. You know, when it's 3-2 and the bases are jacked and you've got to throw, you've got to execute a pitch, you have to have that confidence to deliver on it. Do you, be, and don't be humble when you say this, do you sense you kind of nuance that pretty well? Um, I kind of flirt with the the right sort of balance, and I, I appreciate those kind words, although I haven't actually, I mean, I played pitched two innings over the last two years, but for the, the listeners that aren't familiar with, like, Tommy John recovery, I had UCL reconstruction, mm-hmm. March of 2020, right when the pandemic was starting. And so that's typically between a 15 and 18 month rehab. And all I did during that time, granted, it made, a, made COVID made things a, a lot easier to focus on my rehab because there wasn't anything going on in the world. But all I did from March of 2020 to still now is eat, breathe, and sleep recovery. I, I was, uh, I'm originally born uh, from Dallas, Texas. And when I was with the Mets, we have spring training in Fort St. Lucie, Florida. And I was already down there for spring training. And I had had to make a decision, go home to Dallas and do my rehab, where there was a lot of uncertainty, Mm. or stay in Florida and do my rehab at Crest Sports Performance, which 
is the the mecca of baseball training. Is that Mark Cressy? Is that his? Eric Cressy is Eric his name. Eric Cressy, okay. And I did my, my, my rehab with uh, the PT there, Eric Schoenberg. And so all I did was eat, breathe, and sleep recovery. I had um, an infrared sauna. I got a uh, an ice plunge. Huge into that. Love it. Like uh, I was just listening to Aubrey Marcus's podcast uh, with you on the way up here and yeah. him talking. He just briefly mentioned Wim Hof, which um, I'm huge into. I love you, Noah. I had a, a hyperbaric chamber, a soft shell one, and then I had a uh, like a you, like a, you know what the juve light is. Yeah. It's like a juve but on steroids. It's called yeah. a light stem bed, and I've recently done a lot of uh, Novathor mm-hmm. sessions, which I think those are those are awesome as well. Huge into the blood flow restriction, um, okay. and then. My, my my rehab was going seamlessly like i was hitting benchmarks like way before than i, I should have and but it was at a, a smart pace mm-hmm. nothing too crazy but i was just able to recover really well with because you start throwing after tommy john depending on your the surgeon and how it progresses between four and six months mm-hmm. but your, your ligament at that time is not completely healed mm-hmm. so you basically have to stress it a little bit mm-hmm. So it becomes stronger, and so you're probably around a year, eleven months to a year. You're off the mound, and I was doing great on the mound, and then I had a setback in June of 2021, like the end of May, and uh, that was really discouraging because got an M- another MRI, and mm. some surgeon was telling me like this is kind of tearing again. I'm like, you got to be kidding me! Like oh I did, like, I did, I did all the right things. Like I don't think I could go back and do this all over again and do it any better. Look, you get to the big leagues, and then you do what you were doing in the market you were doing it in, too, right? All the attention, all the noise that comes with being in New York. And then, bam, you know, Tommy John surgery. You guys, I want you to imagine your entire dreams being threatened in a second. You've worked your entire life, your family, your friends, everybody you know, whatever that is. It could be your entrepreneurial dream, your relationship dream, whatever it is, and then, bam. I mean, that's, that's a scary, scary mental time for an athlete, right? And then you're alone in this rehab. There's nobody, there's no 60,000 people cheering for you while you're doing rehab. Mm -hmm. What was that like mentally for you? And did you do anything in particular to get through it? Was it, is it humor? Like what you're talking about, like a lot of laughter, a lot of that, or what would you do? And, and how did it hit you when it happened? Um, I mean, I still remember exactly where I was and what position I was to like when I heard the news, um, because I always thought like, well, March, uh, spring training in 2020, I was throwing really well. I was still throwing really hard. I didn't have an entire walk. I just, the whole spring training, which is typically when someone has elbow issues, like they lose velocity or they lose Mm -hmm. control. And I had neither. And so, and I could take some of leave and be fine. I tried to limit anti-inflammatories as much as I can. Mm -hmm. Um, But I took some of leave and I'm like, I was a lot better. And I'm like, if if I have a blown out UCL, then you'd feel it. I'd feel it more than just some of leave. COVID shut everything down. And then I threw a bullpen, just kind of stay in shape at Cressy Sports Performance. And I threw one of the best bullpens of my life, but it felt like my elbow was going to explode. And, oh, then, wow. I, and then I was talking to the, the Mets BT. He's like, you know what? We have time right now. Let's just get it checked out. And so I remember the MRI just being super pleasant, just jamming to some Adele. Um, mm-hmm. And then Dr. Alchek, who's one of the probably like between Alchek and Dr. Elitrosh here in LA, they're the, 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 the cream of the crop, the best surgeons. And he started talking to me about like what's going on in the image. I'm like, okay, something's not right here. And he tells me, yeah, this is about 80% torn. And I'm like, you gotta oh be kidding me. Oh my gosh. So yeah, it, it definitely sucked, but it happened at a time that, I mean, it was a really shit time for the world. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just allowed me to put pause on everything and just focus on my rehab. And you know, the, the, the surgery is, Almost every pitcher, baseball player, athlete, it's pretty common for, for this to happen. Some guys come back and throw harder after Tommy John. Yeah. There's even a weird thing going on for a while. Did you see this where like high school dads and college dads were having their kids get Tommy John without the need yeah. for it, thinking they're going to pick up three or four miles more of velocity? Do you ever see that? I did see that. That's, that's a crazy? little crazy that's to me, but especially because like the use, of, like you have surgery, those graphs should give you about 10 years. Yeah, right. Of, You're of, limiting of, the time, old. right? Yeah. So, like, you're 15 years old. You have Tommy John at 15. Like, you might need it again in right, 25. Yeah, that's um, that's bananas to me. So but would, you, you, I'm going to ask you something about this, like the mental part of the game, because 
you, you go through this grind. And by the way, I want you everybody to imagine this too. So, you know, when this thing gets, when something like this gets threatened in your life, I had my business career get threatened early in it. Uh, pretty early on, there was a situation that took place and I thought maybe I was going to um, lose my business. And it was actually one of the greatest blessings that ever happened to me because I think I appreciated how fortunate I was in my business prior to that. But there was some deeper level of enjoyment and appreciation that followed it after it was threatened. That, you know, like we always say, everything's happening for you, not to you. And actually, I think that threat happened for me now that I'm in hindsight. I started to really appreciate the fact that I had the business and how blessed I was to have built it and the people around me and maybe more hyper aware of what my opportunities were going forward after this event took place. Do you feel any of that for you? Like, do you think you, you probably always appreciated the game, but do you feel like maybe there's a deeper level once it was sort of threatened and almost taken from you? I, th- I think that where I'm trying to get, I've only really only scratched the surface because it was an 18 month rehab and I just came back for two innings at the end of the season. So it was mm-hmm. like, yeah, that was a great milestone in itself. Mm-hmm. And I'm super appreciative of that but I'm still ready to get like throw 140 innings mm-hmm. this year. And then I think that's when it'll fully mm-hmm. sink in. Cause when I was so like, I was if anything that was going wrong did happen. Like I had that setback and then I got back and I came, got really, really close. And then I went on a rehab outing and in order to come back from your rehab outing, you have to get tested. And I got tested and the next thing you know, I had COVID. So I had to quarantine for 10 days. And the next thing you know, I'm throwing in order to like, if I didn't, I set up a mattress in my apartment in New York and threw balls into the mattress. Yeah. Because if I didn't do that, then I wouldn't, there wouldn't have been no time to build back up. Mm. Um, so it was just, things just kept on kicking me in the balls. But mm-hmm. in order to, I mean, I almost, I, I definitely shed a tear when I was going out there to, to and I was extremely fortunate to Did make you? my return at City Field. And like mm. the goosebumps is an understatement. Um, Isn't it interesting though, all those times you took the field, maybe sometimes it was just like, hey, I'm taking the field again. Now mm-hmm. it's more special, right? Right. Yeah. It definitely give me uh, a more appreciative approach every time, every five days or six days now, because we're in a six day rotation with uh, Otani. So I'll get an extra day. Otani, um, by the way, everybody is a pitcher slash DH for the Angels, who's one of the most, which I'm going to ask you about that with you DHing a little bit, maybe too. I want to ask you about that. But one thing about this video. Um, by the way, I want everyone to take point one here or point two. Point two is that, hey, it, that sometimes when these great threats happen to your life, on the other side of that is far more appreciation and gratitude for what you have. And so if you are going through one of these really difficult trials in your life, on the other side of this will be an increased level of gratitude and probably a higher level of focus too. So just know that if you're going through something right now, imagine having your whole career threatened. Especially with the the setback I had in June, because I'm like, you got to be kidding me! Like, mm. it's it's one thing to have Tommy John once, like it happens to a lot of people, and like I had one of the best surgeons, I did one of the best rehabs, and people that do half of what I did still come back and they're fine. Yeah. Um. So definitely the the setback was a <clears throat> lot more hum- humbling and gave me a lot more appreciation to just stepping on the, the baseball field every time. Because if I were to have it a second time. That's another year to oh, 15 months of not playing baseball, kind of like being forgotten. And that's another thing that was always in the back of my head before I had that surgery. And granted, like the fact that 2020 was a 60 game season, it was more so like, hey, let's just get a season in and mm-hmm. play baseball. I didn't, I don't really count that much as a yeah. season per se. So I didn't really have that FOMO of not being there. And mm-hmm. there's like, there wasn't any fans at game. So it didn't really. I wasn't, I didn't think I was missing out on all that much. It's different to miss a whole full season with people in the stands and stuff. I remember when the report came, I'll be honest with you, man. I remember when the report came out that you may have had another setback. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, and I think even the person said it, I thought that was the end of your career. I did. When I heard the report, I just got to tell you, I heard that and I went, this poor guy's done. Well, luckily when I had that that setback in June, they gave me stem cells and PRP, stem cells from my hip, which I think is unbelievable revolutionary and then i had that the the soft shell hyperbaric i probably spent that's how i got into reading so much is because and started the book club is when covid happened like it gave you a nice excuse to kind of be a lazy couch potato and at a certain point i'm like okay i gotta i need to be a little bit productive i I got my my fix of being lazy now it's time to get back to the the growth mindset and uh, just living life 
to the fullest. So you talk about looking at that pole, right? Looking off at the gate, doing the deep gaze thing. Very few athletes know about going to that deep gaze state and how it can create perspective and stuff too. So I want to go into one other thing about your mental part of your game. Most athletes have triggers or anchors, you know, they've got a routine when they get into the batter's box where they'll take, you know, the gloves off one or two. But what that's really doing is it's putting them into a state. It's triggering, okay, this is my flow state right now. I've got to be hyper-focused in this moment. Do you utilize when you're pitching any sort of trigger or anchor that sort of snaps you into, I'm locked in for this pitch or this inning or this game, pre-game, during the game, anything like that? You know, over the last couple of years, like, pitching hasn't been, like, super easy for me. I've been hmm. very focused on mechanics of how my body is moving, hmm. and that's all fine and dandy. Like. So I pitch once every five days, so it's all great. When you, The other four days that you're not pitching, yeah. that's when you like tinker with how your body is moving mm. and, and whatnot. But once you're on the mound, you, you can't be thinking about what you're like, if, is, are my hips doing this? Is my shoulder doing this? Because that takes away from your ability to get in, into that flow state. So one thing that I've tried to just get better at is, okay, catcher puts down a signal, fastball away. That's all you think about is... Mm. Execute. Way, executing that pitch mm. as opposed to like okay how's my body going to do that to get to that point mm. well i think that's a big part of it by the way i think that and i always relate things to business when i'm thinking about it and i think there's all these things in the entrepreneur the business space tactics strategies you got to do this you got to think this you got to position this, you got to say these words you got to do that it just becomes a point where you just have to execute in the moment and that's what real flow is, by the way. So I'm glad that you said it that way. Real flow is the absence of other thoughts. Mm -hmm. It's not the presence of thoughts. And so for most people who think, I want to get into that state, it's actually being able to empty your mind and focus on the execution of the task at hand, whether it's the sales call, the phone call, the sales meeting, the time you're playing with your kid, throwing a 99 mile an hour fastball on the outside corner of the plate down instead of, you know, at the guy's waist. It's, it's able to execute in the moment. That's really what flow is. What is the difference for an athlete at your level? Because most people will never be in this position. You take it for granted. That, I mean, I don't, I don't mean you take the situation for granted, but you take for granted sometimes great athletes, their ability to do things other people can't do. Mm -hmm. And they do it unconsciously well. So not everybody can throw a baseball like you can throw one. In fact, almost nobody can. Even at your level of play, most guys can't throw a baseball like you do. There's, there's 30 dudes in the entire big leagues that can throw a ball anywhere near like you can. Yeah, and that's at the highest level. It's easy to forget that about yourself, brother. Mm -hmm. But then there's, there's a difference between throwing a pitch in the third inning and you're up five zip than there is in a World Series game and you've got to execute a pitch under pressure. What is that difference? Does something change in your body? Do you have an, do you have an ability to just block that out? Because you, as you know, most guys wither in those moments. You didn't. You won a World Series game, right? But mm -hmm. what is that moment like? Do you feel a difference in your body when the pressure's increased? Is, is there a feeling difference? Is your mind going, oh, my God, this matters? What are you thinking when you're in those moments? I feel like it's okay to feel those different pressures in the situation, mm -hmm. like whether it's pitching bases loaded World Series or you're pitching in a regular season game and, you're up and your team's up five to nothing. You have to treat those the exact same hmm. and like be able to recognize it but don't let one rise or fall hmm. like in terms of intensity like you gotta i mean as cliche as it sounds you gotta stay the same because hmm. the only thing that's really changing is the external cues like the, the the sound of the crowd in a world series game versus a wednesday day game yeah and your team's already up five nothing and it's extremely muggy and, and hot in, in DC. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just the only thing that changes is the external cues, but mm -hmm. you just got to get better over time with experience, with being present, mindfulness, um, just attention to breath, uh, attention to where you are in space. Mm -hmm. You said mindfulness because you, re you recommended Anisha's book, who's been on my yeah, show. That, so. I'm, I'm, like, I'm obsessed with training, recovery, nutrition, and the, the one side of all that that's really lacked over the couple of years is a mindfulness practice. And her book has given me like, it should be religion, like just the, the motivation to, to have a pra a mindfulness practice. Do you think that I'm, I'm blown away by the way? I mean, <laughs> so is my audience. I can promise you that. But do you think you're in a big league dugout? It's a guy like you wants to grow, wants to change is, 
thinking constantly about how to live a better life, sounds like to me, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a formula for longevity in any career as long as your body can stay healthy and you're doing things to help your body stay healthy. Even at your level, I'm not talking about naming names, but do you have guys in there that you're looking at them going, this is the opportunity of a lifetime, man. And they're just, they don't take care of their bodies. They're out late. They, they don't even seem to care about getting better or growing. Does that even exist? In, no names, but in a major league locker room, is that, that exists? Yeah, you'd be surprised. It's, it's quite a bit. Quite a bit. Like if you put a percentage on it. Like me being like one end of the spectrum yes. and then like someone else that eats like burgers and yeah. Pepsi all day. And they're partying in every city you go to and, you know, whatever. You just have guys like there's not a whole lot of people that do what I do. Like mm -hmm. I'm a little yeah. like maniac at times. Mm -hmm. I would I would say maybe close to half of the people. My gosh. To some degree. I mean, you look at baseball players in the past, like David Wells or Bartolo Colon, like the, they weren't like the, the epitome of health the kinda. What about the other side of it? So yesterday, just curious, you don't have to answer if you don't want to. This is a tough one. You didn't know I was coming here. And so you don't have to answer if you don't okay. want to. But so there's the guys that were super out of shape, the Bartolo Colones, the David Wells, the whoever. And there's a bunch of guys that weren't real fit dudes. Then there's the dudes recently that didn't get into the Hall of Fame yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, Roger Clemens didn't get in. Um, Sosa didn't get in. Barry Bonds didn't get in. And we know why they didn't get in. Do you have any opinion about that? about one way or the other, should just the best players be in the Hall of Fame, or do you think there's an integrity of the game aspect to it? That's a, a tricky question. I mean, I, I, I'm not familiar with all the facts, but from my perspective, back in the day, is like it was pretty prevalent in, yeah. in all clubhouses. Mm -hmm. And at that point, with the rules hadn't changed all that much mm -hmm. for like testing-wise, so... Was it, I mean, yes, it was cheating, but I, I don't know. Yeah, maybe the, that's, that's really tricky. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, you had these guys that, yeah, it's tough. I don't know. I'm, I don't watching, know. You, I'm watching you try to process yeah. it. I'm surprised no one's asked you that before. It's got to be something that comes up. I mean, I mean, I stay out of the news. Mm -hmm. I, I saw the whole headlines of the, the Hall of Fame thing, and I, I didn't read into it. I just saw, like, pictures of. Roger Clemens and Barry Bonds, and I just assumed, like, okay, they, they didn't For get me, in. those two guys are different. I'll just give you my opinion. Those two guys are different because I don't know when they actually started, but from what I can tell, these guys are going to be Hall of Fame players or were even prior to doing any of that stuff. But that's just, you know, it's just an opinion that I have. And by the way, a lot of these guys that were facing, maybe they were taking something, and they were probably facing somebody who was also taking something at the same time, to your point. That's so. true. From, from my understanding <clears throat> is, like, do steroids, did they make you, like, a a better player than you would have been without it it's i'm not sure i think it just gave players the ability like baseball is a 162 game season it is an absolute grind i only pitch once every five days and my body gets beat to crap i can't mm -hmm. imagine what the rigors of having to compete like it's different from like doing like a normal practice scrimmage kind of thing and then being in competition phase you have the stress of like the competition plus the actual physical stress of it all so like being like the words that steroids help them recovered were they able to perform mm -hmm. at their greatest the next day as opposed to like maybe 80 percent or 70 percent when they were 100 the next day they could just be at 100 mm -hmm. every single day and competing to their fullest of their ability but I don't know, it's a very thin line it is a thin line man i'm and glad I, it wasn't up to me yeah i'm glad it's not up to me either and i don't know does it increase your bat speed does it increase your power probably i don't know does it increase your velocity i don't know eric gagne kind of was kind of known and to me started to throw a lot harder there after a while but i don't you know i have no idea what the impact of it was for sure i wanted you to, you're talking about something i wanted to ask you about there's a lot of grind in major league baseball most people don't know this most people that don't follow the sport don't understand this but you play 162 games in like 190 days 200 days mm -hmm. i mean it's incredible the amount of games so that's one type of grind the other one is the travel there's a lot of travel mm -hmm. and then in your case there's all the downtime you, you know you said six day rotation now right so like there's a lot of in between and so if you take an l you have a bad outing mm -hmm. You see, the thing about being a, a, an everyday player is you get up the next day and go, all right, I'm going to get after it tomorrow. I'm going to get three hits and get back in the groove, right? When you're a pitcher and you start and you have a 
three inning out, you know, and you're freaking pulled after three innings and you've given up six runs. That doesn't really happen to you a lot. But you have a bad outing. You got to sit on it now for five or six days. How do you have that short term memory, or do you not have that yet? Um, I just get to the point where I'm chomping at the bits. Probably the day one, day two, I'm I'm ready to go back out there and mm. and redeem myself. Uh, you know, you're familiar with Brian Wilson, right? Yeah. The the closer for the yeah. The Giants, he, he, that guy is hilarious. I remember what he said a couple of years ago when he's because he was a starter at first and then was all, like a not all star, but all star, great closer, closer, great closer. And he's like, you know what? You give up. He said the same thing. You're in the minor leagues. You give up six runs one day. The next day, you got to work the bucket during BP. <laughs> and then the reliever comes in, gives up the win. He's like, whatever. I'll just do it again the next day. <laughs> right. Just shag BP. He's like, I want that guy's job, but yeah. no, I don't want to be a reliever, but. Oh, um, let me ask you this. You only had to throw for an inning and you're healthy. So you're not, there's no pacing yourself. How hard could, can you throw if you were maxed out in an inning? I came out of the bullpen, uh, twice in my career. One time because I got ejected against the Dodgers, or both of them were against the Dodgers. One was at home because, no, it wasn't against the Dodgers. I got ejected playing the Dodgers. And then I came out of the bullpen, played the White Sox, and I was just like throwing 101. Oh my and then, same thing it was a playoff outing against the Dodgers at Dodger Stadium. Same thing, but I mean that was all adrenaline juices and and whatnot. But I mean, I still I don't think my mechanics would change all that much because if I feel like if I went out there and went balls to the wall, I'd be sacrificing like to potential injury or um, just my stuff wouldn't be the exact same. Just try not to be do too much out there a human being can throw a baseball over 100 miles an hour do you think there'll be a time where a guy throws 105 well there has been a guy throwing there has been a guy, right yeah Wait, I don't jordan know. hicks what's um, the kid what's the lefty for the yankees the closer hasn't even oh, all this chapman yeah, yeah he's 105 there. it's hard to imagine this but like will the sport evolve do you think that in 15 years there's gonna be a guy who throw 110 miles an hour i mean that's unimaginable um, i mean one thing that i love to see is like the amount of baseball pitching labs you see popping up mm-hmm. across the country like um there's a, a a pitching lab uh, called Driveline, and it seems like they're popping up all over the place. And they, I think they have a lot of really good stuff, a lot of um, ability to track data, mm-hmm. just really almost get, like really get down into the physics of pitching, how your body moves, how your mm-hmm. hips move, and just being just optimizing and, and building off of that. So you think dudes might be able to throw that hard? I think I think it's possible. I mean, if the if the human shoulder elbow can withstand it, I don't I don't see why not. But. So what about a baseball question? You're playing with Otani. He hit, he plays both ways. Do you have any talks with him about you ever hitting or DHing? Uh, probably not. I think uh, I think probably the National League is going to be adopting the the DH this mm-hmm. year. So I got out of there just in the right time. Um, I mean, I I I hit pretty well in high school. I was going to college, play two ways. I don't think I would have lasted very long as a position player um, hitting, but. Uh, I really enjoyed it just because it kind of took the pressure off of pitching, kind of made it a little bit more mm-hmm. lighthearted, knowing that you get to go up there and, and hit. And it's, it was great in the National League because chances are that the, the pitcher you're playing against, if you were not pitching against like Jake Arrieta or Madison Bumgarner, like that should be an automatic strikeout because, where well, I mean, I struck out a lot, but yeah. I might run into one every now and then. Just if like you ran into there. one, it would go a long way. Yeah. Is there anybody that uh, you have a problem facing? Is there a dude who's just got your like number? Like a pitcher-wise or a hitter? A hitter. When you're pitching. Is there a dude you're like, this guy's just got my number? Has there been anybody in the big leagues like that where you're like, I just can't get this guy out, it seems like? Mm, I feel like there's probably a couple. Honestly. I love the fact that it's not readily available to you, actually. I mean, I, I got to think back to all the way to 2019 or so. I mean, I had a pretty rough year that year. But I feel like I was so naive back then. I wish I could just get back to that, that point when mm-hmm. I was... Do young. you really? Yeah, sometimes. I feel like. Why? Uh, sometimes I might suffer a little bit from like paralysis by analysis, sort of. And then back then I was just like. Just throwing. Whatever. I didn't know any better kind of thing. Do you, uh, back then or now, are you in a rhythm with your catcher where like he throws a number down and you're throwing it? Or do you nod off a lot and change pitches for what you want? Mm, I don't. I, like, I like to just grab the ball and, and throw it and not think much. Because I I'm trying to execute pitches. I don't want to think about like really. So you don't nod pitches I, off. Okay, he, if it's three one, he throws he throw he calls a slider. You're throwing a slider. Pretty much, yeah. If I even if I don't like feel confident in my slider that day, because it, it doesn't matter. Like any given day, you could tell like 
all right, my fastball is really working, or my changeup is really working, or my slider is really working. Like, it, it, it really depends on the day. Like, do you go back into the dugout and say, "Hey, man, I'm feeling like this today," or he notices it? Is that a dialogue when you go back in? You go, "Hey, yeah. man, like your 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 sinker's not breaking today. We're gonna stay away from it for a while." Or, or yeah, whatever. the pitcher catcher duo is a pretty vital uh, relationship, and you see it all over with different teams. Like Kershaw had his own mm-hmm. personal catcher, and like got, like I wish I could have a career like Kershaw's. I'd be extremely thankful and blessed for that. Um, but do you love baseball? I do. You do. In other words, it's what you want to do with your life. Yeah, it's pretty. Not all the guys that played love baseball. Do I didn't want to play baseball when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I started off playing soccer when I was four and I loved it. And I started playing baseball when I was seven and my mom made me play. I guess I was really stubborn when I was a kid. Like (laughs) for (laughs) me saying no to my parents all the time. I was like, okay, I'll play as a seven year old. Like I'll play one season and then i was really good i think i just wanted to call it quits after that and my mom's like no you're not and a really funny story because like you're playing baseball you got to go cup shopping and so i remember my i was like seven or eight years old just in walmart and i just didn't want my junk to be like the main (laughs) emphasis of this shopping excursion to walmart so i'm like in this like knock down drag out argument breakdown in walmart in tears because i'm so embarrassed and my parents are just dying <laughs> laughing i think it's the funniest thing ever <laughs> they're discussing your cup size in yeah. walmart yeah and i'm just like this is <laughs> i don't know are well, you do your parents still come out to your games i mean are they still mm-hmm. involved in your oh, career yeah. and super yeah. heavily involved they like traveling to uh just road cities I'm sure they'll make it. Watching sun play. Oh, my man. And then now that I signed with the Angels, I'll be able to get to go home three times a year to play the the Rangers. So That's great, man. What's your dream in baseball? Like, what do you want that you haven't done? I mean, I want to play in the Hall of Fame. Or not play in the Hall of Fame. I want to play myself into the Hall of Fame. Into the Hall of Fame. Um, I just want to play as long as I possibly can. um, Stay healthy. Compete my ass off every opportunity I get. And use use baseball, use this platform to preach what I love and I think could help a lot of other people. You weren't a cross. Is religion, your faith important to you, or is that just uh, um, symbolic? Well, my mom gave this to me, okay. so and she's. It doesn't matter where I'm at. Like if she watches the YouTube video of this, and she's like, "Where's your cross?" kind of thing. I'm like, "Yeah, I am a spiritual person, religious person. Do I know what that higher being is mm-hmm. quite just yet? No. Okay, but I definitely." I'll help you with that. Realize that there is a, a higher yeah. authority to yeah. us. Um, I'm still figuring that out, though. That's wonderful, by the way. Just the fact that you're curious is a really good thing. Mm-hmm. I think everybody's really curious. Just more people are aware that they're curious than other people are. So before you pitch, have you ever had a pitch where you're like, please, God, make this be a strike? Has that no, ever happened? Not yet. It's not one of those things. I haven't okay. reached that point of desperation yet. What, what did, speaking of your parents, what advice would you give to all the parents listening to this who have an athlete in their family? That you know, I think everyone thinks their child is going to be a major league player or an NFL player, and statistically, that's obviously not true. Mm-hmm. But would be any advice that you'd give? And I know you're not a parent, but if you if you became one and you had obviously some good ones because everything turned out pretty good with you, what advice would you give to parents about their ath- their athlete child and going to their games and being involved in their sports? Uh, just any age. Yeah. Well, uh, you had a 10 year old who's playing soccer, you know, and he's just, a, he's a kid trying to have a good time playing soccer. Oh yeah. As a 10 year old, that's kind of, I feel like that'd be an easy one. Just to get him in as many sports and activities as, as you possibly can. I've, it just kind of drives me insane. Every time I run into a, a young kid, whether it be at a gym or like a, a rehab mm. clinic and he's doing the same thing. And his, his father kind of introduces <clears throat> himself to me as Oh, he's a, a pitcher only. And I'm like, he's 11 years old. Like, mm-hmm. he's going to miss out on so much more athleticism yes. that he could be a part of. Great like advice. Soccer, basketball, mm-hmm. hockey, anything. I was just, it's so funny you say that because sports have become super specialized, right? And I was just watching this thing. I'm, I'll mess it up because I'm probably wrong about who it was. But they just showed all the quarterbacks right now. By the time this comes out, this will be over. But that were left in the postseason. It was like Josh Allen and Aaron Rodgers and Mahomes and uh, Brady and uh, uh, Matthew Safford, and they showed all the sports those guys played growing up. Turns out it wasn't just football. 
Some of them will play two, three, four, six different sports. And this idea, I think, you know, that at some point er, too early, kids are picking their sport or their position and all of it. So I'm really, really glad that you said that. Okay, last thing I want to ask you about. This has been really good, by the way, brother. Awesome. I'm, yeah, I'm glad really, you think so. I'm really grateful that you did it. And you're a unique athlete. You're super curious, super smart, and uh, your humility shines through. And honestly, I would just say this. Your parents really did do a great job with you. Thank you. I'll re- definitely yeah. relay the message. And yeah. this is part of why I'm doing this. I just hopefully like my story can inspire. If it just inspires one person, that's good enough for me. Oh, I guarantee you it's more than one today, brother. It's a couple million. And... um inspires me i'll tell you why um it's i i know i'm fortunate to know a lot of athletes obviously you know that and um it just is really good when you meet a good one when the guy's like this guy wants to do good in the world this guy's you're gonna be a great husband someday you're gonna be a great father someday and i think some of those qualities are what are making you a great player and i wouldn't have known that Six six two forty thor you're sort of like known as this physical specimen And uh, that's not what's made you successful, ironically. What's made you successful is your heart and your mind and your curiosity. And um, what do you want this season? What are your what are your outcomes and ambitions in this coming season? Um, you know, uh, first and foremost, I want to stay healthy. I want the ability to go out there and make up for the last two years that I've haven't been able to to Mm -hmm. pitch and the fear of not being able to ever pitch again. I want to be able to overcome that and. For the Angels fans that are listening, um, that I'm extremely thankful that I'm able to share this experience with them. And if they, one thing they don't know about me is that I, I, I love winning. I compete my ass off every time, every opportunity I can. And, uh, you know, I look forward to being able to, to compete with some of the best players in the game in beautiful Southern California. Um, what else do I want to see? Give amount of wins or ERA, or do you not think about those uh, things? I, those are kind of goals that have way too many variables to, mm-hmm. I mean, I could do everything I can to to win 20 games, but wins aren't really a metric for pitchers anymore that aren't super glamorous, because you could give up five runs, and your offense score mm-hmm. seven, and you still get the win, but mm-hmm. you might have a five ERA, which is something no. nobody wants. Oh, no, we want. And then... I, I don't focus on like ERA goals because you just get you get to the point where you, you're you're out there on the mound, you give up a home run, and all you can think about is oh. your ERA going up. So mm. um, that's interesting. I I, I just want to go out there, and every pitch I throw, I want to I want to win that pitch. Very good. Like small, yeah, incremental, kind of like an atomic habit. It's like yep, one percent changes over a long period of time. Very good. Gets you to where you want to be. Yeah. You guys are loaded. I mean, you have really, between Otani and Trout, and, and I consider you in there, three of the top players, you know, your health's back in the entire game on one team. It's, it's, uh, it's, it could be a historically type great roster at some point. So, and I'm super grateful to know you. I enjoyed today. You know what's really interesting is that I think the way that I want to do this is I'm going to release this as even an extra bonus show. I think it's that unique of a show. I think the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to do it as a bonus show, um, as like a gift to my audience, because it's a unique and different conversation we've had today. And I just feel like it's one of these things where I want to surprise them with it. I'm going to bonus them with it because it's been that unique. You're awesome, man. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're awesome as well. Thanks, man. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm rooting for you. I'm rooting for you. If there's anything I told you off camera, anything I can do, you know that I'm here. And so, hey, guys follow noah on instagram we'll put it up on the screen if you're watching youtube get involved in the book club because my book's going to be in it in june and he picks great stuff and so um follow him root for him this year we're praying that your health stays great and that you continue to improve and everybody out there you can follow him on ig and twitter both and in my case this is the fastest growing show in the world for a reason you guys we keep doubling every 90 days it's already a behemoth it's because you all share the show because I can bring you unique people that you probably would never hear in this setting or this forum. And so to get someone like Noah Syndergaard in here and talk about these things for an hour or so is really precious and priceless. So I hope you'll share it with people that you care about. In the meantime, God bless all of you and max out your life. <laughs>